and hello everybody welcome uh to the podcast so uh for those that are just tuning in uh i'm mark uh, and i'm with my co-host shashank we have a weekly podcast where we talk about everything uh, generative ai and sometimes we kind of deviate from uh ai so in, in a certain sense it's the gen ai meet so we call it the gen ai meetup podcast but in a certain sense, it's kind of like the the general AI podcast because uh, we just got to talk about whatever. Um, but uh, we run a meetup event in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, just uh, some general housekeeping before we get started. There are some bigger events that we have coming up. So uh, Thursday, July 25th, 2024 at 6 p.m., we have a meetup in Palo Alto, which is going to be an exciting one. Uh, where we will be building intelligent AI agents. So uh, Shashank will put the uh, details of that in the uh, podcast description. So if you're going to be in the area at the time, we'd love to see you there. Uh, I think you'll be able to learn quite a bit about AI agents. And if you want to know more about AI agents and kind of get primed beforehand, uh, Shashank and I, we uh, talk a little bit about AI agents in the last uh, podcast. So uh, feel free to l- listen to that one. And then on August uh, 20, hold on, let me get the date. August 22nd, we're going to do one, another larger event in Mountain View uh, at the Databricks office. So um, it is, uh, they're going to be talking about their new uh, programming slash prompting framework. Um, so it's going to be a thing that can be uh, used to build agents and or program large language models called DSPY. Uh, it's a pretty cool uh, project. It's all open source. Um, and they're going to have four people uh, kind of talk about how they built it, how they're going to how they use it, um, how we can use it to fine tune models. Uh, so it, it's a very uh, I think it'll be a very exciting uh, talk. Uh, last time we did an event at Databricks was absolutely awesome. Uh, they talked about how they built uh, their uh, GPT-4 class model, which is all open source. When we went there, I, I felt like when I left, I uh, kind of had like the building blocks that I needed to build my own GPT-4 <laughs> class model, which was fantastic. So I uh, hope to see you all there. Um, but yeah, uh, we do meetups once a week, every Thursday. But uh, yeah, there's uh, not a ton in the news. We got like a few topics that we're going to discuss. Uh, first one uh, is Mistral. Uh, Mistral AI. They came out with a brand new model today, which is uh, very exciting. Um, uh, Shashank, do you maybe want to describe what the new model is? Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> just taking a look at it today. Uh, they call it Mistral Nemo. Um, it is the best state-of-the-art model of its size um, compared to all the other smaller models uh, close to 10 billion or smaller. Um, The cool thing about this, uh, apart from the fact that it uh, aces the benchmarks in a variety of metrics, is that it has a ridiculously long context window compared to all the other models of its size. So for reference, um, all the open source models from Google, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Microsoft, they have like an 8K, 8,000 context window, um, which is roughly, you know, um, 8,000 words or so. Uh, this one has a 128K context window, which is massive, um, more than 10X uh, the size of the other uh, competitors. Um, it's, it, you know, they haven't uh, talked too much about how much training they did, uh, how big the data set was, or how much money they spent uh, trying to do this. But they partnered with NVIDIA, so I would assume they have a lot of resources behind them right now, at least for this particular model. Um, And like you were saying uh, before we started the podcast, given a company this size, it's really impressive. They're a tiny French startup um, with... I would say dozens of employees, um, as opposed to like OpenAI, uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, which have large, large teams. Um, so yeah, really cool, tiny model, state of the art. Um, 
and I think it is open source too, so you can probably download it and run it locally. Yeah, it is, it is open source. Yeah, I found it. It is ho- hosted on Hugging Face. Awesome. Um, so I tried to run it. Um, it seems like I I didn't actually try that hard. Um, it's I'm slightly bigger than the Yeah, other. exactly. Oh. I wasn't able to run it like super easily on my computer, but also I spent like two minutes trying, so um, just didn't have a lot of time to get today to play around with it. But um, yeah, it's it's very exciting because um i remember uh when we were talking about like llama 3 8b um which is like uh meta's or uh, like slash facebook's new small model mm-hmm. it was around like chat gpt level quality so like gpt 3.5 quality which is i think when did they come up with that maybe a year ago something like that mm-hmm. and uh this uh, so Llama 3 8B has about GPT 3.5 level quality, which is like, you know, ChatGPT took the world by storm. This one, uh, it seems like based off the benchmarks, it is uh, slightly better or we can even say about equivalent to um, like Llama 3 8B. So this Mistral model is probably around ChatGPT level quality. But uh, the big difference is the context window because ChatGPT, I think, only had like a 4,000 token context window, something like that. It was either 2,000 or 4,000. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But this is 128,000. So, I mean, like 50x, 60x. I mean, that's crazy. It's like wild. Um, and uh, the fact that you could probably run this on your computer, um, probably like a high-end MacBook Pro, something like that, you could probably run it on. Uh, that's fantastic. So that is really democratizing um like what these models can do so you won't need to uh hit a server uh you won't need to pay for an api this is 100 percent free and uh i think it'll open up like a lot of uh, interesting use cases uh, because it's bringing these large language models uh literally just for everybody for the masses um so i don't know uh Shishal, we were kind of talking about this before on like large models versus smaller models, like, mm-hmm. uh, and kind of where their place is. Like, do you have like any ideas of where we would maybe see, uh, some like use cases for these, uh, smaller models and like when we'd want to use it, uh, and like what types of use cases we'd want to use it for over, um, some one of the, like the state of the art models? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, cause, uh, I think, most of the time, I default to using the best models from either ChatGPT or OpenAI, I mean. Uh, so that's the GPT-4.0 or Google's uh, Gemini Advanced. Um, or if I'm through perplexity, I have access to the Claude uh, models. So most of the time, I default to using these large models. But if I have some side project that I'm trying to automate and do some research. Then I have some agents that run repetitively trying to uh, crunch some data, uh, do some tedious tasks that don't really require that kind of processing and that kind of uh, intelligence. So for those use cases, I try to use the smaller models to um, both for the speed, the efficiency, and also cost. Because like, you don't want to be spending a bunch of money if an agent runs wild. Uh, if you leave it running for uh, a couple hours, um, God forbid, like a whole day, and it like racks up a huge bill with OpenAI's uh, larger models. So you don't want that. I I think uh, agents is definitely a popular use case for using smaller, um, more targeted models that are better at certain domains. Um, and also to like fine tune. I think it's much easier to fine tune these smaller models than larger models with uh, less training data because uh, they have uh, less memory to kind of replace, um, and it's a lot easier to uh, tailor something. Uh, it's one of these smaller models for a specific use case, um, and yeah, I mean you have a lot more freedom. You're able to run it locally, control it more. Um, as opposed to these black boxes, which are these larger models from these larger companies, um, you just don't have that much control and ownership and custom customization options. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. Um, you know, funny story, not even related to AI, um, but talking about like just <laughs> rising costs. I remember, um, I 
I think I had just graduated from college, so I'm dating myself now, but I think it was around 2016, maybe. I was working on a side project, and uh, for some reason, I think I had maybe like uh, published some API keys on GitHub or something. Um, it was probably that. <laughs> it was probably the publishing the API keys on GitHub, but did someone find it? Somebody found uh, it very quickly and yeah. uh, spun up like, I think it was like a bunch of Bitcoin miners. Uh, uh, and they just like made like uh, the highest end, like EC2 instances that you could possibly have. So just like spun up a bunch of like virtual servers on, it was like, Amazon. And um, I was like, I don't know, 22 or 23 at the time. And I had, you know, no money. And um, I, like I was looking at the bill and I was like, the heck it's it was like forty thousand dollars oh my god uh and i was like what is going on they even let you spend that much i don't know um like like i have no idea uh luckily like i i talked to the the fine folks at amazon and they refunded all of the money for nice. me which was good it, were you charged that amount no okay i i it didn't like go to my credit card okay. but yeah. it's like a monthly billing so it goes like i think it was like at the end of the month like you're supposed to pay and i was like hey look like so you chart you saw a charge on your credit card for 40 something no no no, no. uh like i because uh, i logged into my amazon okay, web in services the in the billing yeah, yeah. it was like i can't remember uh it was it was like thousands of dollars and it kept on like just like going up and up and um it turns out that like pro tip amazon has lots of data centers all over the world um, and in AWS, uh, like the Amazon Web Services portal, um, you only will actually interact typically with one data center at a time. I hate that. It's so complicated uh, to figure out so, what resources you have. So it's like, you know, you might be like in Virginia, you might be in Ohio, you might be in Japan, you might be in uh, Seattle, whatever. And uh, like I, I shut all down all the servers for one data center, but then I didn't shut them all down for all the other ones. So I couldn't figure out why it was still like increasing. So Anyways, after a couple of days, cleaned it all up. Amazon was like really great about it. Mm -hmm. Amazon, fantastic company. Highly recommend them for all your data center needs. Uh, they, you know, helped out like a, a poor college student. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. That just uh, reminded me of that. So nothing to do with generative AI, but yeah. I, I remember doing you still don't want that. I remember doing something like that with uh, Amazon, not publishing my API keys, but having some instances running in some other geolocation and... I forgot to turn it off, and this was uh, at one of my previous startups before I joined Google. And uh, we'd shut down the startup, but these servers were still running. <laughs> and I was being charged uh, a couple thousand dollars. I think it was roughly 10K or less. Uh, and I was like, this is crazy. I haven't done anything. These resources are just running idly, but it's, it's racking up a massive bill. And I was like, can you guys, you know, do something about that? <laughs> it's like, I haven't used anything. Uh, I'm not even sure what I'm paying for. Yeah, they they actually were really nice and uh, waived that bill too. Um, but uh, trying to bring this topic back to uh, Gen AI, I think these larger models have gotten really good at finding these zero-day vulnerabilities in your source code, other people's source code, um, to try to prevent these things from happening. So if, you know, if you're working on a project on GitHub or elsewhere even, um, having an LLM like uh, peer review your code before you publish, submit, whatever is seems like a good idea to find issues before they happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Although I don't know if it would necessarily get you published in API keys. Now, uh, just public service announcements, never, ever, ever write any API keys in your code, ever. Uh, store them as environment variables. Um, but... Yeah, don't write it like directly in your code. Learn that the hard way because sometimes like you just accidentally may publish it. And make sure however you're writing those environment variables are also not being uploaded to your source code because um, oftentimes they're like uh, uh, stored as a plain text file um, on your local environment and you need to sometimes ignore that file from being included in your Git repository. Yes, yes, definitely good advice. And actually, now that I remember, I don't know if it was 40K or if it was 15K. Anyway, I, I remember it was over 10. It, I don't know. It felt like infinite money because I didn't have that much. So uh, all, all I know is I didn't have enough money to pay it. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Amazon. Um, anyways, uh, 
Speaking of AI stuff, uh, Andre Karpathy. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so Andre Karpathy, uh, I think we talked in like a previous episode how he was leaving OpenAI. Um, and uh, we finally found out what he's going to be doing. Uh, so he was doing a bunch of stuff. He published some open source courses where he was te- pe- teaching people how to build stuff. But he's coming out with a new company uh called eureka labs so eureka labs is really exciting um all we have is a landing page but uh if it's from andre carpathy i think you could know for a fact that it's gonna be uh, probably pretty legit so uh it will be uh basically using ai to help teach you things so uh, he said imagine you're trying to learn physics and you have Richard Feynman helping you every step of the way. Um, I, I would imagine like uh, maybe you could have like Albert Einstein trying to teach you relativity and sitting down with you. But instead of like Albert Einstein, who isn't alive anymore, or Richard Feynman, who also died a long time ago, uh, you could have uh, an LLM trained on uh, some of the greatest teachers and thinkers uh, of our time, which may uh, just help level up the world's knowledge. So that's really exciting. Uh, we don't know much yet. Uh, there isn't uh, a lot of uh, info, but incredibly exciting. Uh, so we'll be uh, keeping you updated. So as we learn more, we'll, we'll tell you about it. Yeah, it seems really cool. He seems like the perfect person to approach this problem. Uh, not only is he an expert in AI, having um, spearheaded the efforts both at OpenAI back in the day and also recently uh, and in between those two stints, working at uh, Tesla and uh, furthering their AI efforts. Um, before that, he led a bunch of uh, AI courses at Stanford. Um, I think he created the first uh, uh, deep learning class uh, for uh, uh, computer vision models. Um, and you know, his first prototype for this new company, Yuri Collabs, is to. Uh, build the world's best AI course, uh, LLM 101. Um, I feel like his background in teaching and AI, um, he's going to approach this in a really cool way. Um, and this is incredibly exciting. Uh, when I was uh, uh, younger in school, I was like, you know, learning a tedious subject with a boring teacher is just sucking the fun enthusiasm out of me. And it, it really, uh, it, you really need some enthusiasm from your teacher who is guiding you, who is showing you this whole new world and uh, building up your curiosity, building up um, your imagination to see the beauty of a subject of math, of chemistry, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, like he mentioned, if you could have Feynman teach you physics, oh my God. Uh, I remember watching the Feynman lectures and he's just so charismatic, so uh, passionate about what he's doing that um, it just rubs off on you. Even if you don't know anything about physics, um, listening to his lectures uh, is just magical. Yeah, Richard Feynman is like a really cool guy. I, I read this book, or I, I didn't read it. Um, like I, I am terrible, like actually, like physically, like reading a book. Uh, but I, I listened to the audiobook because I think I was on a plane and. You know when you have it where like your your body is busy but your mind is free, mm-hmm. uh, where like maybe you're cooking or like you're walking mm-hmm. or like running or something like that, driving. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, it's not the time where you could like actually like sit down and read a book. Uh, I love audiobooks. Yeah, I, I think like my like uh, attention span, I've lost something. I, I think it's the whole world right now. You don't have to justify it. Yeah, but anyways, audiobooks is fantastic. So. Uh, there was a book about Richard Feynman called, I think it was called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. I, I read that one. And uh, it was just like full of different uh, like anecdotes, little stories yeah. about Richard Feynman. Um, like, uh, it seems like he was like a master, like safe cracker, um, where yeah. he would go and then uh, try to like just break into people's safes. And um, it's a lot of fun. I have a lockpick set here too. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Have you ever, like, been able to, like, pick a lock before? A bunch of locks, yeah. Really? Sometimes uh, I got stuck out uh, or some friends lost their keys and I just went there with the lockpick set and then uh, jiggled it open. Man, that sounds like a really just useful life skill. It is very useful. Ethically, of course. Sure. Yeah. 
<laughs> we don't condone just like picking any random lock. Uh, not in uh, a public podcast. No. no, no, that would not be good. No, definitely not. We we, we don't we don't do that. One hundred percent not. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like good. I mean, like if you like accidentally like lock your keys in your car. Um, I don't know, like get locked out of like your gym locker or something like that. Even if like you just you forget the combination on your master lock. Yeah. Uh, because then like that's a hassle so anyways um like i would love to get a lock picking course by richard Feynman. i think that'd be pretty cool i don't know if he's the best uh, teacher for lock picking but maybe <laughs> something else i don't know or like uh he also worked uh on um the man the manhattan project right yes. yeah with like the first nuclear bomb and uh he also came up with like a bunch of physics stuff amazing uh researcher uh in I guess quantum mechanics. Um, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I'm I'm ready. I am so ready. Um, okay, all right. Uh, nice. Next topic. Um, let me just pull up the notes here. Oh yes, Microsoft. Microsoft is working on LLMs for spreadsheets. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, useful. Uh, so uh, not like a, a huge news story, but I feel like it's little um, improvements like this, which are just going to like really improve our quality of life. Um, because right now, um, like I've tried to play around with uh, making spreadsheet formulas with mm -hmm. an LLM. So one thing that I was trying to do um, a couple months ago, actually it was during tax season. I wanted to try to calculate like what I would expect my taxes to be. So I said, like, okay, based off of, like, the marginal tax brackets, based off of my income, like, how much money am I expected to pay in taxes? Mm. And I tried to make that spreadsheet with an LLM because I didn't want to do it by hand. Mm. Uh, it couldn't figure it out. Mm. It was really struggling to to do that. Uh, what, what did you give it? Just the raw data? Or did you give it, like, the, the schema of the data and have it write some functions to transform that data? So what I did uh, when I was giving the uh, the LLM the data is I took... So uh, for I, I know that we have uh, listeners from all over the world, not just the United States. So in the United States, we have uh, what is known as a... I think it would be called a progressive tax system. So basically... Um, uh, as you make more money, uh, the the next dollar is like taxed more. So I think it's like the first like I'm just gonna make up some numbers. It's like the first zero to like ten thousand dollars uh, that you make are taxed zero. Uh, you don't pay any tax on that at all. And then like let's say the next uh, ten thousand dollars. So from like if you make uh, ten thousand to twenty thousand, that next ten thousand dollars might be taxed at let's say five percent. So if you made $20,000, uh, you'd be paying, um, you made 20,000, you took home 20,000, but then let's say you're only getting taxed on 5% of that $20,000, 5% of, oh, so, uh, of that, of the $10,000. So like, that means you keep the 10,000 that's yours free and clear percent at 0%. And then the next 10,000, uh, what are 5% of that is what yeah. is that 50 bucks or something? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So 50 bucks. So then, uh, you're in the 5% tax bracket, but then you're only paying like 50 bucks of tax on the $20,000 that you had. So, and then like, it just steadily increases. And then like, once you make over, I forget, it's like 200,000 something, then like you're taxed, like everything over that is like 40 or 50%. Uh, it's like, or I think it's 37%. Anyways, it's pretty high. So what I did is I took those, uh, those rates. So like from, zero to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 70, 70 to 120, whatever. Um, and I took all of those tax brackets and I said like, hey, uh, ChatGPT, why don't you make me a, a spreadsheet that can take an arbitrary amount of income and then calculate what the um, tax rate is? Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to find out what the difference between ferried, filing married, uh, or sorry, filing single versus filing jointly. So uh, whether it made any difference at all. It turns out that it didn't. It didn't make any difference, but I was curious if it would make a difference. Um, so I tried to have it uh, make that spreadsheet for me and it struggled. It struggled hard to uh, do it. I haven't tried recently, maybe like with the new models, it'd be able to do that, but I'm excited to see if this new LLM 
uh, from Microsoft for specifically working in spreadsheets uh, would be able to do uh, such a task. Um, also, what I wanted to be able to do is uh, I wanted to be able to take um, uh, like um, so, you know, I track like my finances. So like, you know, we could sometimes see like uh, what type of transactions were made, like take the credit card, I put it in a spreadsheet, you analyze it. I wanted to do all the analysis for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that'd be like really cool. So it could help you figure out, like make more informed financial decisions based off of like the all the data that you have because right now like a lot of that is just like a manual date data wrangling because it's all from a bunch of different places is real uh, a real pain to work with so if microsoft can figure that out that'd be fantastic it would really improve the quality of life yeah that sounds uh incredible because i think uh most of the startups today are running on spreadsheets not any fancy databases um, but just like regular old spreadsheets that are being wrangled by PMs or even like the CEO of uh, small companies. Um, I, I thought that, uh, Microsoft would be the one, uh, or Microsoft would have done this way back when, like last year when they announced Copilot for their workspace, uh, suite of tools. But I, I think they were just doing the bare minimum of plugging in chat GPT and having it see the entire spreadsheet, which is what you were doing, I assume. And I, I don't think it can understand uh, structured data, especially like numbers and uh, correlations between different tables, et cetera, um, in a meaningful way. So looking at uh, the uh, blog post, um, it seems like they have like restructured the way they're trying to uh, build this LLM. They are adopting um, a new tokenizer uh, to try to encode this information that is in the spreadsheet and multiple tables and columns, um, try to uh, compress that information in some meaningful way that the uh, LLM can understand. And they're also using, you know, uh, in regular LLMs, we use chain of thought prompting. They're using a uh, chain of uh, spreadsheet prompting. Uh, prompting where I, maybe you could explain chain of thought prompting and, and also a tokenizer i feel like uh, lots of buzzwords lots of uh, yeah. jargon yeah, so yeah, yeah first uh, maybe we'll talk start about what chain a token of thought yeah start with chain of thought yeah i think i think it's a little simpler to understand um so uh you know when when solving a uh a math problem for example you know you multiply two numbers um you know how, how do you do that you you don't just uh, magically uh, have the answer for like a multi-digit, like a four-number digit times a two-number digit, like one, two, seven, five times 56. It's like, you're not just going to magically, boom, here's the answer. You break it down. You're like, okay, take the six, uh, multiply it by the last digit, carry over the 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 extra number, add it to the, uh, the one to the left. So... Um, Reasoning about a problem in multiple steps um, and collecting all of those, those intermediate uh, results and combining that with the next step in reasoning to come up with a cohesive answer is like a chain of thought uh, method. So that usually results in a much uh, more thoughtful answer than uh, having one single prompt. So um I don't know what would be a good example for a chain of thought uh, reasoning step. Um, that's tough. I don't know. Um, okay, I'm looking around and uh, there's uh, I have like uh, this handle broken in uh, my cutting board or something. So uh, you know, tell the uh, LLM. Okay, um, how would I fix this? Uh, think about your steps. Uh, assess the issue. Uh, write down the. Um, you know, the uh, materials required to solve this problem and give me like a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide. And then they'll be like, okay, fine. Uh, let's look at the problem. Uh, this is this is what's broken. Okay, how do I fix it? Maybe this is what the materials that I could use. Um, thinking about this in multiple steps is um, chain of thought prompting. And so it's a, it sounds almost like the, what is it, like the Socratic method or something like that, where uh, they like just like formal logic where it's like okay like if this is true then this is true that means this is true it's like i think it's like the classic example is like oh um if all dogs are brown and i have a dog therefore my dog is brown uh not that like that's actually correct yeah. but like you know it, it, it would 
be like, you know, I mean, if those, change the thought. If those uh, statements are true, then uh, the Socratic method would lead you to the correct answer. Exactly. Uh, and I think a chain of thought prompting might employ uh, the, you know, strategies from formal logic uh, and Socratic methods, et cetera. Um, but it's just a general strategy to think in multiple steps before coming up with an answer. Yeah. Uh, very, very cool. And then uh, you also brought up tokenizer. Yeah. So um, I think this was uh, an issue to address the fact that uh, computers don't think in uh, natural language. They think in zeros and ones. Uh, they look at numbers. They do uh, mathematical operations, matrix multiplications, linear algebra, et cetera. And uh, the researchers were trying to figure out how do we get these machines to understand human language, uh, real world uh, images, video, et cetera. So they came up with a way to compress, uh, just sticking with natural language, compress natural language into um, tokens that represent uh, the language. So they started, uh, I, I, I forget I, the uh, you know uh, complete breakdown, but um, it is a way to decompose uh, words into smaller components um, that make sense by themselves um, and compress all of this information uh, of natural language to fit it into um, some vector of uh, numbers that computers can do operations on. Um, yeah, I always kind of thought as like a tokenizer is like just like a program that can take uh, some training data and then uh, basically break it up into meaningful uh, chunks. Um, so it could be words, but it's just like uh, like specific chunks that have meaning. So like uh, like a specific word may not be enough because a um, there's also things like capitalization, punctuation, mm. like if I would numbers. Exclam- yeah numbers. Proper exclamation names. marks, proper names, stuff like that. Um, also, it'd be like potentially like a, what is it like homonyms? Like two words that, uh, or is it homonyms? No, because I was thinking two words that sound the same but are spelled differently. But what I mean is just like different, uh, same spelling, di- different, like different meanings. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, so like, um, is that what it is? Same spelling, different meaning. Yeah. Homonyms. Okay, so I did get it right. Um, anyway, so I think that like, you know, oftentimes like context is important. So like a tokenizer will try to figure out like oftentimes like what the meaningful chunks are, uh, and how they relate to each other. So, um, anyways, uh, now that we have chain of thought and tokenizer, just, let's to, just as a quick uh, example. So if we were to break down the phrase, I love dancing, uh, period. So I would be a token. Um, love is small enough it would be a token um the period at the at the very end would probably be a token by itself uh dancing would probably be broken up into dance and ing because those two can be uh shuffled around and used in different contexts by themselves um because like ing is a very common uh present continuous it's kind of like doing a part suffix that can be applied to a bunch of different words so running surfing exactly so that by itself can be a token that can uh be identified in a bunch of different words um and it still retains the same meaning it's like the present continuous form of some word um and dance on the other hand is also you know self-contained uh it has its own meaning um yeah yeah so anyways uh with that being said now that we talked about chain of thought also, fun fact, the uh, Mistral Nemo uh, with an amazing context window, uh, great at multimodal uh, performance, also built a new tokenizer. I think that was partly the reason why they achieved such great performance because uh, I feel like we're reaching diminishing returns in terms of uh, what these new companies are able to do uh, at a certain scale of uh, model size. Um, and this model, you know, it, it is better than all the other models, but it's a, just a few percentage points better at all these different benchmarks. So to get significantly more performance, they're going to have to rethink their entire approach from the ground up. Uh, and that includes the tokenizer and not to mention everything else in the stack, including, you know, what you know, kind of architecture your GPU has and um, what uh, model you're using, maybe uh, make modifications to the transformer architecture itself and so on. 
Yeah, you know, that that's a really uh, good point. So I was going to bring us back to the spreadsheet LLM, oh, yeah. but uh, I feel like this is a really good digression. So let's uh, let, let's go along this digression a little bit. So um, I think that's uh, – I remember we were having a conversation actually last week at the meetup yeah. uh, where we were talking about uh, tokenizers. Oh, and okay. uh, apparently tokenizers is actually one of like the hardest things uh, to build in your LLM. Yeah, I think everyone is just using uh, OpenAI's tokenizer. Um, cause it's easy and, uh, it's, uh, proven to work at scale. Um, and not everyone wants to go through the trial and error process of building a new tokenizer. Yeah. So it seems like tokenizers are almost like, uh, like both a combination of like both art and science, uh, to try to figure out like, you know, how you're going to break up the tokens and like how you're going to chunk the data. So, uh, exciting. Um, I think. It was like Andre Karpathy said that like a tokenizer is one of the most important parts of making like a state of the art LLM. And then I also, cause it's like the first step. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then Maybe step two, the first step would be getting the trading data. Well, sure. I mean, there's lots of little yeah, steps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you also need a computer to run it on. You need to be born in the first place. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it, it's like the, uh, um, I think it's like the famous joke. It's like in order to create an apple pie, at first you create the universe. The universe. Yeah, exactly. Did Richard Friedman say that? I don't know. I feel like he's he's someone who would have said that. It, it was Russell who said that. I think it's Richard Feynman, Yeah. Oh uh, well, no, I was thinking uh, our good uh, mutual friend Russell, uh, who who said that. But or or Carl Carl Sagan, one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said that. Anyways, um, but I was listening to uh, an interview. Like a while ago, where G- when GPT four first came out, it was Lex Friedman interview with Sam Altman, yeah. and they said that there wasn't any like major architectural difference between like GPT, like ChatGPT and GPT four. Even mm-hmm. though GPT four is way better, it was just like a lot of little improvements uh, that created something significantly better. So, um, like potentially things like a tokenizer uh, would be like a little mini improvement that you made uh, that can make like the model um, way better. So. It's nice. exciting. Anyways, uh, bringing it back to spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. Yeah. Now that we've defined all our terms, so yeah, what does that even mean to build a tokenizer that can understand, uh, uh, you know, tabular data? That is interesting. I I feel like they probably need to retain um, some relation between the things in the same column. Uh, you know, relation between the column headers, maybe. Um, because, you know, if you have a bunch of numbers that are related to, uh, you know, expenses versus a different set of numbers related to, uh, income, you kind of want to maintain that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, when I read the blog post, apparently they had to strip out a lot of uh, relevant data in order to, to do this. So, um, one thing they mentioned is oftentimes like, uh, the color of a cell will be meaningful like maybe like oh like uh this cell will be covered like red because it's like mm. bad or like this one is green because it's good or maybe like uh um we're like losing money we're winning money uh, whatever it is um and uh, apparently they stripped all of that huh. color information out um because it just became too unwieldy to work with mm. um so i don't know what else they stripped out but uh we'll see like actually how useful this is so my guess is that uh, if you have just like uh, plain vanilla uh, data that isn't like too complex, maybe it'll work well. But like I would assume as the complexity grows, it may just get worse and worse dealing with it. Yeah, I, I wonder how this compares to um, some of the LMs that they've come out with to help you build SQL queries uh, more easily because uh, that's somewhat similar. Um, if you're trying to do some business intelligence tasks to uh, get some insights about your uh, customer data or something. Um, There are, I think Databricks actually has some tools uh, to help you write SQL queries with the LLM, with the help of the LLM. You tell it what you want to do, what kind of insights you want to get. And then boom, it gives you this query, you run it and it crunches the numbers and gives you the data. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. It, it seems to me like it's a little different because I feel like it's a little more complicated. I think the Excel one is more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the thing with um, SQL queries 
you don't actually like care that much about like the data, but you maybe the schema. You care a lot about the schema. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think you care a little bit about the data. Um, no, I don't think you do. Well, you probably care a little bit about it. Like, so for example, if I have um, like a date, maybe I want like something like after like a certain date. Um, mm. So like I might care about that, or like maybe I want sure. something within like a certain range of numbers. So there, I care a little bit about the data, but I think that. But, uh, like, uh, the data isn't in the context window at all. Right, exactly. Like, the schema is sufficient. Right. Yeah. Um, because, like, if I have a date, then, like, I know that, like, okay, I can, like, pick a date, like, uh, after this date, before this date, maybe at this date, within this date range. Um, same thing for, like, uh, like a string. Like, if I have a name, maybe the name starts with the letter A, whatever it is, right? But when you have spreadsheets, like, spreadsheets can do, like, so much more i mean like you can go and then embed like graphs into your spreadsheet oh, right like fair. i can put like images into there mm -hmm. uh i could color it you can't color your sql data mm -hmm. um yeah i could uh have add another uh value that says color <laughs> <laughs> well i mean sure <laughs> Um, like you can go and then, uh, have like, uh, cells refer to other cells and do like a formula on that cell, which like updates another cell, which updates another cell. You can't do that in SQL. Um, I mean, like you could write a program that yeah. like interacts with it, but like spreadsheets are way more powerful than SQL, like, and significantly more complex. Um, also like the data that you could store is like huge. I mean, like, uh, people run like entire businesses, uh, on just spreadsheets i mean spreadsheets are like uh i think spreadsheets like are, i would say spreadsheets are a superset of sql databases yeah they're probably heavily powered by these same databases that we're uh bashing on but uh they are a superset yeah but like i think spreadsheets are fantastic like fantastic uh, amazing right because it's like great starting point uh, and oftentimes enough for most people <laughs> as opposed to going to an actual database or, or like a programming language, right? Because like, you know, maybe like uh, with like if I have like a Python program, I can make something even more powerful than like a spreadsheet. But then like you have to do like all this programming and like formal logic and get a computer science degree and like think about all this stuff. It's just like it's too much. But with like a spreadsheet, you could take like an hour course or just like kind of, you know, mess around with it and then like build some like really awesome useful tools mm -hmm. like i could you know track my spending with a spreadsheet i could do my taxes with uh, a spreadsheet i could um like i don't know like uh calc like keep track of my health data um uh, th there's so much stuff that you could go and do with just like a spreadsheet um anybody can do it the barrier to entry is really low I, I can store it as a file i can send it around i can upload it to the cloud like it's it's fantastic mm -hmm. um like spreadsheets uh and like like specifically like microsoft excel and like google sheets are i think some of the just like the best tools that like regular people could use mm. for just like interacting with their data yeah i wonder how this would uh this new microsoft uh, spreadsheet lm would perform to um let's say gpt5 which is you know an order of magnitude better than today's state-of-the-art lms and... well we assume we don't know that <laughs> You know, let's say the next version, sure. whatever whatever that's called, whenever that that's released, because um, that wouldn't. Maybe I don't know. What do you think? Uh, so the question is: Is would this surpass um, like the new okay. Steer model? Yeah, I I think it it might uh, just because this seems like it's uh, purpose built for this particular type of data, um, and I found that. When I have, um, so, uh, like one thing that I was doing is I was trying to keep track of all my investments. Mm. Um, so, uh, I put all of the investments into a spreadsheet and I said like, Hey, uh, ChatGPT, can you analyze this? And it said like, Oh, you have, uh, and I was like, Hey, like, what do you think I should do with my investments? It said, Oh, I think you should sell your NVIDIA stock. And I was like, I didn't even own NVIDIA stock. <laughs> 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 um, so it was like. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. You don't own NVIDIA stock, but, like, you should sell your TSMC. I was like, I don't own TSMC. Oh, it's like, God. I don't know what you're talking about here. So, um, like, it gets confused. So, like, I don't know if, like, scaling it up will solve fundamental, like, issues. Because that seems like 
it's fundamentally broken. Um, so I think that scaling up the model uh, won't make it like better. It'll just maybe make it like a bigger idiot. Not sure. Um, so I, I think that like you might need to have like uh, some sort of like purpose built um, architecture that will help um, work with spreadsheets directly because however um, GPT-4 is parsing the spreadsheets, it doesn't do so very well. Yeah, according to this uh, paper, um, they beat GPT-4's vanilla um, analysis by like 25% or so. So it seems pretty significantly better, um, but we'll see how the next generation of uh, chat GPT, uh, you know, if it just swallows all the other competitors who are trying to focus on these niche use cases. Um, well, I mean... You would think that Microsoft may have some insight onto what OpenAI is building. So maybe they would uh, think um, that, like, it's not going to be obsolete. Um, you you would think. I mean, it seems like they they have, like, some sort of financial interest in OpenAI. I mean, I think even within uh, the same company, especially large uh, organizations, corporations, um, there's competing efforts to try to solve the same problems. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, why do it once when you can do it twice? <laughs> it's better to. Uh, anyways, uh, that is that is also another strategy uh, that we use to get the best answer out of LLMs. Have them just come up with the an answer for the same question multiple times and pick the best answer. I mean, that does work. Yeah, actually. Um, much better performance. Yeah, yeah. Or even just like the same question to multiple LLMs and then even ask better. them to kind of compare with each other. So like, hey, Josh, we T mixture of, not mixture of experts, uh, but like, like uh, a combination of the <laughs> mixture of the Claude uh, Opus. It told me this, like, uh, this seems like a better answer. Yeah. How do you have to say? Can you give me a better answer than what Claude gave me? Or find uh, loopholes in this uh, answer. And then, yeah. Uh, that that would work. Um, so, anyways, we are about out of time. I had no idea we'd be just talking so much love about spreadsheets. I feel we probably lost like half the audience like after the first ten minutes. Uh, but if you're still with us, you're a true um uh, member, a true OG. Uh, so we thank you uh for uh listening to us opine about spreadsheets. Uh, is opine the right word? I think so. Anyways, uh exciting stuff so anyways uh thanks so much for listening and we will catch you in the next one